sisters here in California and to my brethren in the Philippines, good evening and to everyone, good day. It's another day that the Lord has made and we are truly blessed to be together. And now here in uh, Fresno, uh, California, at the home of our brother Robert Pedrigal, he was uh, one of our missionaries to Africa. And his wife, Risa, just uh, celebrated her birthday yesterday. So it's a good time of the year uh, for me and for all those that I interact with. And I know that uh, I have many uh, co-celebrants uh, during this day. And I simply thank and praise God for all of this. Uh, before we go further, I'd like to invite you to say a little prayer with me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, I thank you for the gift of life that you have given to me and for the gift of life for all of us who are participating in this uh, fifth international podcast. You, Lord, are truly such a wonderful and generous God and we are filled with many good things that come from your hands. Praise and thank you for all of those, Lord. And we offer you this uh, time as we continue with this uh, podcast. May you... Fill us with your spirit, and may everything that transpires be for your greater honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. St. Francis of Assisi, pray for us. So my dear brothers and sisters, what I wanted to do for today, uh, which is my 70th birthday, and half of that time, 35 years, has been spent serving the Lord and serving my brothers and sisters uh, in Couples for Christ and now CFC FFL. Wow, it's been a long time. It's been a great time. It's truly been a very blessed time. When I started in 1981, uh, when we started in CFC, I had uh, two sons. Now I have five children and 11 grandchildren. And what the Lord has shown me in this, in just this particular aspect, is truly the importance of community for the life of the family. I know I could not have reached this far, far and experienced the blessing of my extended family, if not for the support of brothers and sisters in the community. We started in 1981. Twelve years later, we established the family ministries, and that has been a great, great blessing. And uh, my children have uh, been in the community. They're part of it. Uh, those who are married uh, met their spouses in community. And I can see that at this uh, advanced age that when the time comes that I have to leave the scene, the community will be there for my children, for my grandchildren, for the generations that are to come. The biblical blessing for family is uh, three generations. The Old Testament speaks of uh, for you, your children, and your children's children. So that is what I have been experienced. I have experienced. And praise be to God for that. How I started in the uh, renewal, well, uh, as uh, has had happened with uh, many young people, uh, I, I actually uh, was raised in a Catholic home, very strong uh, Catholic parents, went to Catholic schools, but uh, I lost my faith in my youth. And for a long, long time, even to the time when I had already gotten married, I was no longer living out my faith. But there, come, they came, there came a time, and this is how it is with the Lord. There's a right time for everything. And in His great love for me, He, he did call me. I had my exposure to the renewal. And I think, some of you might know uh, Father Polinar. And I went through his uh, life in the 
spirit seminar together with my mother and coming from a life of uh, sin that was uh, unusual for me. It was a new experience. And then uh, there was a point where uh, my wife and I, my wife Jerry and I were invited to a Life in the Spirit seminar that was mounted by the Ligayan ng Panginoon community. And the timing was perfect because I was uh, searching, I was uh, down, uh, I had uh, financial difficulties, my uh, worldly dreams and desires uh, were, were not uh, happening. And so we were invited and uh, I agreed to go. And that was in January of uh, 1981. And there were 16 couples in all. And I was surprised because I went through that whole program. I forget now how many weeks uh, that was, but weekly I was there. Uh, there were even times when I was the one uh, telling Jerry, hurry up, we, we don't want to be late. I can't say that there was that great impact uh, on me during that program. Talks are good, uh, fellowship was good, but yeah, it, it, it was one of those things. But of course, definitely I knew that the Lord was already working in my life. At the end of that seminar, they kept us together, probably figuring out uh, what the Lord would want for us. Because at that time, they had uh, just intended to bring us into the community as uh, new members. But the Spirit was saying otherwise. And so we were together for a few more months. And after prayer, discussion, discernment, it was decided that a uh, new movement for family renewal uh, would be established. And that's when in June of 1981, Couples for Christ was born. And from then on, there was no turning back. And uh, uh, Couples of Christ uh, grew and uh, expanded its work. Uh, it, we, we, we looked to uh, sharing our experience with uh, many others. So uh, from the 16, then we had uh, another program where we invited our friends, our relatives, our uh, people that, that we knew, and that is simply how we grew through the years. It's been a life of great adventure, roller coaster at times, many ups, many downs, but 35 years has been truly a very, very great blessing for me, certainly for my family. And I do hope that in whatever way that God has also used me to be a blessing for many others. I can count my blessings, uh, so many. I've been to 86 countries uh, of the world basically doing this uh, work. I would not have been there, I would not would not have seen many places, would not have uh, met uh, many brethren and had many experiences if not for this mission work of Couples for Christ. I've been to many homes you know, because that's how we do things in the community. When you're there out on mission, then you're a guest you know, and uh, their homes are your home and I've experienced that and this is actually the biblical blessing that uh, Jesus uh, spoke about in Matthew 19, verse uh, 29, that uh, if you give up uh, homes and, and relatives, uh, brother and sister, father and mother, and uh, children for his sake, then you will receive many, many more homes. And I count countless, <laughs> countless homes throughout the world as, as my own. Uh, I know I'm welcome, I'm loved, I'm fed well, and I simply enjoy this uh, bounty that the Lord has given us. In the service to the church, I've had the great privilege of personally meeting and interacting with three popes. 
from John Paul II, who of course is a saint today, to Benedict XVI and now Pope Francis. And wow, uh, that is uh, truly something that uh, I will uh, cherish. Never in my wildest dreams would I have thought. But these are the gifts that the Lord uh, has given me. I was privileged to work for Vatican recognition for uh, Couples for Christ because as we were growing and as we were expanding and we were bringing the ministry to uh, many different countries, uh, we thought that it really would be good if there was that kind of uh, international recognition. And so we worked at that. We had to get uh, the endorsement of uh, bishops in the countries where uh, we already were. And that uh, recognition was given in the year 2000 at the Experimentum for five years. And we became officially recognized by the Vatican as one of the 100 odd uh, communities, uh, new ecclesian communities that the Spirit was raising up for the work of the third millennium. At that time, we were the only community in Asia, as uh, most of the other communities were from Europe and uh, South America. So that was a real, real blessing. My wife and I uh, are or were uh, members of the Pontifical Council for the Family for two terms, starting from uh, 2003 up to recently when uh, the Pope uh, folded up this uh, dicastery uh, and uh, established a new one. You know. And in the work of uh, Couples for Christ, uh, I was involved in uh, many different ways and in different meetings in Rome and elsewhere, uh, with the, uh, being uh, there as a part of the official delegation of the World Meeting of Families and uh, events like those. They're also involved with the Pontifical Council for the Laity, of which uh, CFC, being officially recognized, was a member. In 2014, uh, I was privileged to participate as an auditor, uh, auditor meaning a uh, lay uh, participant, in the extraordinary assembly of the Synod of Bishops. So that was a year-long synod starting in that uh, October of 2014 and then they had another synod in October of 2015 and out of that came uh, uh, Pope Francis' uh, apostolic exhortation, uh, Amoris Laetitia. So it's been a great time uh, serving the church and enjoying many of those privileges, interacting with uh, cardinals and bishops and uh, known cleric and, and lay uh, uh, preachers and, and workers in the, in the church, I truly have been so blessed. One thing that I got to do, which again, uh, never in my lifetime would I have imagined, and, and I was not formally prepared uh, to do, was to write books. Through the years, even in the early years of CFC, uh, I have been writing articles, uh, reflections, and uh, teachings, and all of that. And I had a regular uh, column in our newsletter before uh, from the director, and people were encouraging me, well, why don't you write a book? Why don't you write a book? And I just thought, uh, who? Me? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know the first thing about doing that. And, uh, I'm, I'm not gifted for that. And so I, I, I held that off. But in uh, around 1995, I put together a teaching based on the call of uh, Peter uh, in the Gospel of uh, Luke, where he was called to be a uh, fisher, fisher of men. And that was a teaching, and eventually I 
talk more about that. I expanded the the things that were there, and eventually that became uh, the very first book that I ever wrote, uh, Fishers of Men, which came out in 1996. Today I still consider that book as uh, one of my uh, most satisfying and very interesting, uh, the development of that uh, passage in Luke and really looking into the work of uh, evangelization that we are so very much involved in today. Many, many, many uh, blessings. Of course, as I said, it was a great adventure uh, that had its uh, ups and downs like a roller coaster. So I also had my share of uh, tragedies of uh, very, very difficult times. Well, before I met the Lord, before I was uh, brought back uh, to the Lord, uh, one big tragedy was the loss of my older brother, uh, Vicente Enteng. He was murdered in his uh, farm in uh, Batangas. So ah, that was a very, very uh, traumatic experience for the family. Of course, family members uh, die of many causes, but uh, he was murdered. Uh, brutally. And then more recently, uh, a few years ago, uh, I lost one of my grandchildren, my grandson Giovanni, uh, who had just celebrated his first birthday, uh, died of pneumonia. And uh, these were very difficult times in my life, certainly in the lives of uh, family and their direct uh, families, but uh, I felt those uh, losses very, very much, great difficulty. In my uh, life uh, before the Lord, I was uh, involved in a lot of uh, secular uh, things. I had gone to uh, business school in the United States and uh, went back uh, soon after I finished because I thought that uh, yeah with, with, with this uh, uh, MBA uh, degree now I'm set to conquer the world you know, for my own selfish desires and money, power and whoopee and uh, that's how I went into uh, my uh, business life. I worked first for a uh, company and established a well-known company but pretty soon decided that, uh, hey, I'm not really going to get rich here. So I struck on, out on my own to be an entrepreneur. I was in partnership with the Japanese and we got into uh, many different things. We were into uh, exports. Uh, we established a woodworking factory and a number of other things. Uh, you might say that I was the proverbial jack of all trades, but master of none. But I wanted to to, to do so many things and accomplish so much in so little a time. But anyway, the, uh, the point of that is that uh, part of the uh, great challenges and difficulties that I experienced in life was that uh, with all of those businesses, many of them uh, very, very, you know, not, not the established type of uh, business, uh, I was into mining, I was into uh, seafood processing, uh, we, we exported uh, live coconut trees uh, uh, abroad, uh, we were into uh, woodworking, but doing this on, a, uh, on thin capital with a lot of loans. But anyway, long story short, uh, I experienced great difficulties and almost experienced uh, bankruptcy. And to someone who really wanted to conquer the world and uh, have the, 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 the money and the power and the good times that uh, uh, people look to, uh, that was a devastating blow. But actually, that's what brought me to, to the Lord. Because there was a time I was thinking, you know, with the, the, the bills piling up, 
and uh, the, the, the banks uh, uh, calling on their loans and uh, I was at the edge of my rope and there was uh, nothing I could figure out to do and so I said to myself well hey there, there is a God this God that I've turned my back on but he's there uh, let me try him out once again uh, they, this were happening in the uh, late uh, 1970s and that's why in 1980 uh, that's where I uh, with my mother went to the Life in the Spirit seminar Father Polinar and then the next year in June uh, we were invited to that uh, uh, seminar of the Ligayan ng Panginoon and from there everything else is uh, history because I had said that I had uh, strayed from the faith and, uh, but I, I uh, got married to my wife, uh, Jerry. Uh, by the way, we come from very large families. I come from a family of 10. She comes from a family of 14. And, and really, as I look at how uh, birth rates have plumbed, uh, plunged, uh, even in, uh, with us, uh, who are all pro-life, but in just uh, one or two generations, you know, you, you don't need population control, you don't need contraception because uh, that's just naturally how things would go. As uh, you know, the economic development in the world, as the culture changes. But anyway, we, we enjoyed the big families and that's what we're uh, enjoying now. But because I was far from the Lord, our marriage was open in crisis. In my business, I would go uh, all over the country and, and indulge not just in business, but in monkey business. <laughs> so uh, it was a great challenge. And if we had not, if I had not been called back by the Lord, uh, we would be one of the statistics now of broken marriages. And none of what the blessings that I've just mentioned uh, would I be experiencing uh, today so many great things many great joys but also great uh, sorrows in the life of the community that poses uh, its own challenges as many of you probably also know and as you have experienced in your own lives uh, and for those who, who, who serve it's not an easy task. We do what we can, but we need to see that, uh, well, we really need to trust in the Lord that everything is in His uh, good and faithful hands and that everything does work out for the good of those who love Him and who are called according to His purpose. But there will certainly be challenges. In the life of the community, in uh, CFC, one big challenge uh, happened uh, 12 years after, you know, and that's when we separated from the parent, uh, Ligay ng Panginoon. Basically, it was uh, because uh, Copos for Christ was uh, growing, but uh, Ligaya, uh, our parent, basically saw us as just one of the many outreaches that it had did an outreach to businessmen, the Brotherhood of uh, Christian Businessmen and Professionals. It had its own outreaches to, 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 to women, to youth, to singles, uh, to the poor, and the outreach to couples was just one of them. And uh, there was not so much of a mind to uh, really expand uh, massively and rapidly. But that's what the Lord was doing. It was something that was unavoidable. It was uh, the work of the Spirit. We wanted to really share uh, the good things that uh, God was uh, giving us. And the couples, the new couples who would come in would be bursting with enthusiasm and they would want to bring in uh, other couples. You know. And so we really wanted to expand and not just in the Philippines but in other parts of the country. But there were challenges for example, because the CFC as well as BCBP had become fishing pools for Ligaya, 
And so many of us who were the top leaders in the community were being brought into Ligaya as uh, members. But this uh, provided uh, conflict because uh, most of our weekends as uh, members of Ligaya would be taken up. We, we had uh, every, every weekend we had our activities. Uh, and so we were also in parishes as CFC and uh, the parish priests were looking for our elders and they simply were not there. So that was uh, one challenge. The evangelistic expansion was uh, another challenge. Uh, and then there were uh, the desires of uh, family members who were not couples to also participate in the work. Because up to that time, uh, Couples for Christ, and that's why it got its name, was uh, only for couples. And the Lord impressed upon us that it was uh, necessary to work on the relationship of husband and wife being at the core of the family uh, so that uh, the family itself would be blessed. And it was specially necessary to bring in the men. Uh, because even in the situation today, uh, many of those who go to church or are actually active in parishes serving are the women. Uh, and that was uh, the situation then. But uh, you cannot just have uh, the women without uh, the men uh, as uh, uh, being renewed and taking their rightful place uh, as a head of the family. So there was a focus for these 12 years, but there was pressure and there was a desire to bring in the non-couples, our children, you know, uh, the, the singles, the youth, uh, uh, the couples themselves were feeling the need to be supported in raising this game together. And in uh, 1993, uh, we decided to, you know, we, we talked it through and there was an agreement that we would go our own separate way. And that's where uh, Couples for Christ in 1993 uh, went off on its own. But there were some uh, difficulties there. Uh, there were some uh, tensions and even conflicts. The brethren who stayed with the Gaia, the brethren who just uh, went with us. So that was, uh, you might say, the, the very first split. Uh, then, as uh, many of you know, there was a second split, split within uh, CFC itself in uh, 2007. And basically, you know, it's a long, long story, uh, but uh, it came out of our disagreements on how to handle our uh, work with the poor. But what that uh, did was uh, to split the community and uh, now the Couples for Christ that uh, I and those of you are part of is uh, called Couples for Christ Foundation for Family and Life, uh, CFC FFL. The splits actually have been uh, the history of the church and during that time a uh, number of bishops were uh, assuring us or consoling us, you know, well, that's the way of the church. And many religious congregations, such as the Franciscans and the Carmelites, have split and re-split. You know. But after so many years or so many uh, centuries, you know, they reconciled, all serving in the church, all being blessed. So God always has His purposes. When a work is uh, getting much, much bigger and uh, uh, many opportunities come up for service, and you get uh, many brethren coming in with their own ideas, with their own uh, passion. And at some point, this uh, clash and conflict happens. And maybe the best thing is uh, when they split, go their own way. Uh, as long as they don't uh, uh, really fight with each other. Uh, then the work of the kingdom actually expands in all of that. So... Uh, the, my, my life uh, in the Lord and in the community has been uh, characterized by these uh, great ties and these great loss, uh, lows. And I would say that uh, blood, sweat, and tears. But that truly has been part of the, of the blessing. Now when I talk of blood, I'm talking... Uh, Literally. And there have been a number of times that I've been uh, literally bloodied, shed my blood. 
and and uh, even uh, uh, cheated death. Uh, most significant was significant was uh, what happened to me in 1989. Because in uh, 1989, uh, I I felt ill. Uh, uh, the the symptoms are like uh, the flu. And uh, one, one night uh, in August of uh, 1989, uh, while the family was uh, in, in the uh, dining room, they were having their meal, but I was uh, in uh, the room. Uh, I had a uh, high fever. Uh, I was wrapped up in a uh, blanket. And suddenly I, I, I just felt uncontrollable chilling. You know? I was shaking and it was uncontrollable. So I... I, I got up, wrapped up in my blanket, I went to them and said, I think you need to bring me to the, to the hospital. And as soon as we got in the car, I passed out. And later I just uh, was told uh, what was happening. Uh, I, I passed out and uh, Jerry was uh, so worried that uh, you know, I would uh, bite my tongue, so she even put her... her uh, thumb in my mouth and later showed me that it was uh, black you know, because I was biting into it. Uh, they rushed me to the hospital. We had to pass by a clinic because I couldn't breathe and they gave me oxygen. Uh, then I was uh, brought to the hospital and I was in a coma for three days. And, and all my bodily processes uh, were uh, failing. The, the uh, doctors uh, who were looking on and evaluating and seeing uh, what seemed to be happening gave me a 10% chance of survival. Uh, they actually told Jerry you know, that, that that was it for me because 10% uh, chance uh, I think means that, well, you're not yet dead. And they, they said it, they, they didn't really figure it out, uh, something like blood poisoning, septicemia, meningococcemia. Uh, during that week that I was in the hospital, there were two, two incidents of very, very similar uh, illness, and both of them died. And uh, the doctors were telling uh, Jerry that, you know, if ever I would survive, uh, I would be a vegetable. And that's why, brothers and sisters, if I act strange at times, I have my excuse. What's yours? But anyway, the community came out in force. They were praying for me. The, the doctors, the nurses, the, uh, uh, those who were work, uh, working in the hospital, St. Luke's, uh, were, were wondering, who, who's this celebrate, celebrity? Because uh, there are so many people in the corridor, uh, outside, they were praying. But it was the, your prayers. It was the prayers of God's people that saw me through. I was in a coma. Uh, it was expected that I would die. Uh, on the third day, I just woke up. And I was well. And... and of course, I, I still couldn't get up. They, they had all of these uh, tubes uh, in my mouth and, and uh, medicine in, in, in my uh, veins. And I stayed, for a few more, stayed in for a few more days in the hospital. And after that, they couldn't figure it out. I had wanted them to, the, the doctors, to look into what had happened because I, had, uh, I, I, I knew that it was a miracle. And I had wanted them to come to that conclusion, uh, but you know how it is. You're okay, here's your discharge slip, then, then go. But that was uh, quite an incident. There was a spiritual message there. And we had just actually finished uh, a week earlier our planning for the decade of the 1990s. So this was in, in August of 1989. So we planned for the decade of the 1990s and we uh, decided that uh, uh, we would do a rapid and massive work of evangelization. 
And I think that what really happened was that uh, the evil one, of course, is aware of uh, God's plans uh, and wanted to stop all of that by taking out uh, one of its main leaders. That just happened to be me. And of course, it doesn't work. And uh, uh, God has it, had his counter uh, uh, punch, you know, raised me on the third day. And that simply encouraged the community. And, and, and in the decade of the 1990s, that's where we really did and experienced rapid and massive evangelization, where we were doubling our numbers from year to year. Those were the days. We look forward uh, in this new evangelization to, uh, for, for that kind of evangelization uh, once again. And it really is so much uh, needed today as it had always uh, been. 1989. Now there was a time when we did the mission in uh, Vanuatu. Uh, Vanuatu is in uh, Oceania. And Vanuatu is a beautiful place. Uh, it's like a paradise. You know? And uh, we were there to start uh, Compass for Christ. We had a scheduled uh, a Christian life program. But uh, during the day, during the week, when people are at work, so we were off, went off uh, uh, R&R. And uh, uh, we, we went off to few hours away from the city and to this uh, very nice uh, place, uh, uh, beach, you know? and there was a reef, a uh, rock stone reef uh, that projected uh, by many meters out into the sea. You yeah. know, I, I love those things. So I, I walked up to the edge of the reef and I was enjoying the, the waves uh, gently uh, um, uh, um, hitting the, the reef and, and lapping at my feet. And then I didn't see it. You know? But I was uh, swamped by a big wave you know? that, that threw, me, threw me down uh, backwards. And I, I felt I was drowning in, in all of this water. I could just cry out to the Lord. But uh, it threw me, threw me back, and I felt that uh, my uh, trunks had gotten uh, snagged in the rocks. I was trying to to get get free, uh, but the waves were pushing me me back, you know, and I couldn't. But that's actually what uh, saved me, because later, when when the wave went out, I saw that uh, right just beside me, just a, a meter or two away was where it went out. And if my trunks had not snagged on those rocks, I would just have been brought out uh, into the sea and probably under the ledge of that reef and uh, just be lost forever. Anyway, the only thing I lost was uh, my glasses, uh, my sandals, and of course I was uh, bloodied you know, because the rocks were very rough and I was... Uh, Black and blue, I was slammed, you know, my back. And in the days that uh, followed, uh, I was black and blue, you know, in the back of my thighs, you know, really black and blue. I had to be on crutches. And uh, we conducted the Christian Life Program, giving a talk in, in crutches. You know. It was quite an adventure. And uh, I, I really nearly lost my life at that time. There were other incidents, maybe not as uh, dramatic, uh, not as life-threatening. Uh, I remember one time when I was just in the office and uh, working late. It was already uh, evening, you know, just, just at my desk like this, uh, working late. And I, I felt some uh, discomfort in my the genital area you know, and, and uh, seemed to be you know, uh, something. So when, when I reached down, blood, you know, I didn't notice because I was wearing uh, black pants, you know, blood. You know, and I went to the toilet to look, it was bloodied all over. You know, my underwear was uh, so bloodied. You know, uh, I, didn't, I didn't 
feel uh, anything, but it was bloody, uh, full of blood. And, and, and so I, I called and uh, some of the brethren, uh, they brought me to the hospital. So uh, uh, Cardinal Santos is just near our, our office at that time. And uh, so the, the doctors and the nurses uh, came. Uh, they couldn't find anything. There was no wound, and and I I don't know what they did in my genital area, no? uh, but but wow, what was that? What attack was that? So I call it the incident of the bloody balls. So uh, amusing at, at at times, but wow, how. Uh, one can really shed blood uh, in many different ways uh, in our life and uh, mission, especially considering the uh, assaults of the enemy. It's interesting that uh, uh, Hebrews 12 verse 4 says that in your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding blood. In my case, I have. It's a constant uh, struggle against uh, sin, against the forces of the enemy. And uh, I've been privileged to also be at the receiving end of this uh, assault of the forces of uh, darkness and to shed my blood in that case. There were a number of challenging missions. As you probably can imagine, you yourselves. As you go out on mission, uh, face some of these challenges. I remember when uh, we started in Libya. Libya. No? At that time, uh, that was the time when Libya was a no-fly zone you know, imposed by the United States. So you couldn't fly in. You know, we had our contact with the uh, priest. And I was the only one who went. It was a one-man uh, mission uh, team and we had to go through uh, Malta and uh, take the boat, uh, travel overnight you know? and, and of course all of this was unfamiliar and uh, no real, no real uh, contacts and uh, how to move about and uh, go about things. Uh, when I went into that uh, boat there were a number of uh, men assigned to that room and they had taken all of the, the uh, sleeping quarters. <laughs> it's good that the, the sofa was still there and that's uh, where I went. And I couldn't quite uh, sleep comfortably because, uh, you know, uh, what does all of these men uh, uh, might do? <laughs> and and uh, we, we sailed into Libya and uh, when we got in, uh, immigration was uh, checking the bags and uh, they saw my Copos for Christ stuff, you know, and the, the stickers and all of that. It's good that they uh, didn't do anything more than to confiscate them. Uh, they took uh, the stickers, but they let me through. And that was actually one of the bigger, if not at that time, the biggest uh, CLP that we had ever done. Mainly among Filipinos, there, there was a, a, a few uh, non-Filipino, but uh, mainly Filipinos. Uh, we had a big presence at that time, especially nurses you know, in the hospitals. If I remember right, there were almost 200 that uh, finished that uh, Christian Life program. And I was the speaker, I was the guitarist, I uh, guided them in how to do the discussions. Uh, and... and uh, the, the what happened afterwards, uh, training some of the leaders. Oh, wow. That was very, very uh, exciting in uh, that particularly challenging part of uh, uh, the world. You know? I've been to places like uh, India. Uh, India is very exotic. And uh, the, uh, aside from the Philippines, the biggest uh, CFCFFL group that we have actually is uh, India. You know? And uh, you, know, you know how our Indian brethren, most of them, like very spicy food. So we were there, we were being treated by uh, some, uh, the, those that we were relating to. You know? uh, 
as we were going to look to establishing um, uh, couples for Christ. And so we, we had a meal. And basically, he's saying, you know, tasting, wow, this is so hot. No? Uh, but they said, no, actually, that's mild to us. We made it mild because uh, we knew that you couldn't take it. Oh, wow, if that's mild, uh, I don't know what, what is hot. But during one of those uh, evenings, I remember, uh, we were uh, sleeping in a room. I was sleeping in a, in a room. Uh, it was warm. There was the electric fan. But uh, I had uh, just shorts and a shirt. When I woke up the next day, I was full of mosquito bites. I took a quick count, believe it or not, like 200 bites all, all over my, my legs and my, my, my hands. And, but I, I, I didn't notice. I, I slept soundly. Good thing there was no Zika yet at the time. So these were some of the interesting uh, uh, side lights, uh, highlights uh, that, were, that were happening. We went to Russia. We did mission in uh, Russia. But that was a time, uh, those of you who might remember, there were bombings, big bombings in Russia. On the day we arrived, there was a big bombing. On the day that we left, two weeks later, there was a big bombing. And, and well, just mission is so exciting. We established uh, CFC at that time among some uh, expats with the help of, uh, uh, I think, a, uh, American priests. But we also got in touch with the Orthodox Church. <laughs> we wanted to offer uh, the program to the Orthodox Church. And we, we, did, we did speak to two of their uh, clerics. And I, I thought it went uh, quite well. You know? uh, but, but, you know, it, it's not that easy to, to return. Uh, constraints of uh, finances and uh, time and who would do these things. Uh, and so uh, nothing came uh, of that. It would have been great if it did, because today I see Russia as uh, part of the hope for the world. Uh, it has become a very Christian nation. You know? It is uh, the total opposite of how uh, things are turning out in uh, these United States and in many first world countries that have turned away from the faith, uh, actually. But Russia today is probably the most uh, pro-life and uh, pro Mar Mary uh, nation. So look, look, look for good things that will uh, happen uh, uh, in and through uh, Russia. I have always experienced uh, God's protection in all of this time because I'm, I'm a very adventurous uh, fellow. I love nature and uh, I would go out uh, literally on a, on a limb if uh, uh, the opportunity was uh, given to me. Uh, so I see, even before my renewal, how God had protected me. In uh, the businesses that uh, I was uh, telling you about, we were into logging in Palawan. And one time when we were in a remote island uh, where uh, there were remote part, part of the, the island uh, where there were uh, no uh, people, you know? uh, so uh, we had our operations there. And then uh, uh, for the night, I, I had my small tent, uh, the tent for one person, and I set it up on the on the beach, you know, uh, inside the water, because uh, inside it was uh, uh, much uh, veget vegetation, so the open area was in the beach. When we woke up the next day, there was this big, big uh, boa constrictor you know, wound up around our tractor. Big. You know, it was very long. You know. <laughs> I was just thinking, what if it, he had decided to, to uh, embrace my tent instead of the, the tractor? So these are interesting things. In my travels throughout the country, uh, the Philippines, uh, one time I went to Holo in uh, Mindanao, and when the plane landed, uh, the, the airport was like a 
it was, and it wasn't like it was a militarized zone. The, the soldiers were there, the sandbags were there, the machine guns were there in, in uh, the airport. You know? so, so I went and uh, went about my business. A few days later, that's when Holo was sacked and burned uh, by the Muslim rebels. <laughs> what if uh, that had been the time that I was there or preventing me from, from leaving? Uh, in Mindanao was as well. Mindanao, by the way, is, uh, is uh, beautiful. Uh, we had also a fishing business, so we were based in a, an island called uh, Tabawan. It's a, it's a small island, but uh, really uh, beautiful. And I visited there, I stayed there, all Muslims around, with my Japanese partner. And uh, what happened was, uh, during one of those visits, a few days after I had left, again, the Muslim rebels attacked. They machine gunned our our boat. You know, people had to to dive into the sea. One 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 of our men actually lost his eyesight because of that. Wow, uh, another uh, uh, very close uh, call. You know. In Palawan, uh, Palawan is a favorite place. Uh, it's such a beautiful place, and a number of you have uh, been there, but. Uh, in the early, in the, in the 70s, uh, I was doing the rounds of uh, uh, Palawan and uh, there weren't that many tourists yet at that, at that uh, time. So one time I was also in a remote area uh, doing our uh, business. We were in uh, silica mining and uh, other stuff that we were looking at. But uh, what, what happened was uh, uh, there was a storm. It was a very, very strong storm in this uh, remote area. So, but, but you know, I, uh, I, I couldn't just stay there. I had my other appointments. I had to try to find a way. So what we decided just with another person that I was with was to trek through the forest in order to get to the town where we could get some transport. So the two of us in, in a storm, Breaking through the forest, literally a forest, he had this bolo and he was hacking through through the, the, the brush. And certainly there were snakes there, big snakes. And you know, anything could have happened. In fact, my my parents were so worried because they knew there was a storm and I was there and there was no contact. I had been uh, I was like lost and they had to, to get in touch with the authorities to try to look for me. Really exciting. Of course, we, we made it uh, to the town where we were, and there we were able to get a boat to uh, go to uh, real uh, civilization. Uh, in in, uh, in uh, driving, driving a car, uh, at least twice I turned for a circle, and then you know how, how, how one can really get into a serious accident but came out of that uh, unharmed uh, there was a time when I was driving in uh, Manila and suddenly wow you know, something smashed through the, the windshield on the right side some crazy fellow had thrown a bottle of uh, coke you know, in, in the air and it smashed through uh, the windshield right, right beside me you know. uh, what if it just uh, moved a little bit and right in in front of me. Uh, we were doing mission one time, I was driving uh, my uh, guitar and uh, very, very sleepy. So uh, we actually uh, veered off the road and awakened because I, you know, veered off the road and there was a, a mound there that when we hit that, you know, ah, that's when we, we woke up. But even then, because I, I was conscious that I was following a tricycle, uh, and then I, I, I couldn't remember anything anymore. I, I fell asleep. But what if I had hit them? Or what if we had gone the other way? Because the other way was uh, uh, down into the sea, into the waters. The car wouldn't start anymore, and we had to uh, leave it. But, you know, you know, these this, uh, kinds of... Kinds of uh, uh, 
things. A number of other things. Uh, we were on vacation with uh, the family in uh, Kashmir, in uh, Srinagar, and and uh, you know we doing the the tourist uh, things. You know. uh, so uh, the next day when we were supposed to leave, we were surprised. The city was in lockdown. The the military had locked down. The, the city because there was a terrorist attack and that terrorist attack was in a uh, some kind of uh, military school compound that we passed by uh, the day before uh, in in our tour oh, wow, wow and and uh, the next day the, that is what happened you know, we had to take the back ways into the airport the airport was uh, uh, very tightly guarded and and all of that so Many of these uh, adventures, uh, I love adventure. I love these uh, new experiences, whether it's uh, taking an ultralight plane in Kenya and flying low uh, over, over the trees and seeing the wildlife down there, uh, whether it's uh, parasailing in uh, Saipan uh, or doing the Australian rappel in uh, Palawan or uh, uh, taking a uh, uh, peking duck in Beijing. You know, so originally Beijing, but, but there, you know, they give you peking duck. It has a black, small black crispy scorpion. That <laughs> you <laughs> as part of the uh, peking duck. I love to jump off uh, high places. They are not very, very, I once, but uh, off the cliffs, done it in Iligan, in, in South uh, Africa, in uh, Cebu, as we did our canyoneering. I love uh, whitewater rafting. Uh, I, I'm adventurous even when it comes to, uh, to food, as long as it's not onions. <laughs> so I've uh, eaten, especially in Africa, all kinds of uh, meat, whether it is uh, ostrich or crocodile or snake or the different uh, uh, deers and uh, wild meats that they they have it's a really good thing i think that also has to do with uh, my patron saint who is uh, saint francis of uh, assisi i do identify a lot with him he loved nature as well Brother Sun and Sister Moon and talking to the birds and communing. Uh, such a wonderful thing, uh, God's creation and appreciating God's uh, creation. He was uh, passionate in evangelization. Uh, he even went to the Muslim Sultan to try to convert him. And, and uh, his life was spent uh, doing that. He was into self-renunciation, uh, uh, didn't want any of the worldly goods. He, he, he was a man of the world, uh, but uh, when he received this, uh, when he was uh, converted, uh, he actually went to his father and gave everything up and took even the clothes off his back and gave it to his father. And uh, from then on, he lived in his, uh, uh, he had this uh, sack, sack cloth and uh, lived uh, begging for his uh, food. Uh, he was a man who disdained uh, uh, privileges. Uh, and like unfortunately many today uh, in the church and Christian communities, servant leaders who look to uh, power, position, prestige, and perquisites. But he was a person who would have none, none of that. Uh, I... I and not into uh, material uh, things, and I don't look for uh, those things. You know, I, I like to keep my life uh, uh, very, very simple. St. Francis uh, felt uh, privileged to suffer. He saw the value of uh, suffering. In fact, he recognized how great a sinner he was, and uh, at times when there would be temptations of the flesh, he would actually throw himself into a thorn bush, you know, uh, 
in order to discipline uh, himself. He also had uh, disappointments within his uh, order, the, the, the congregation, uh, the order of prayers minor that he established. And as it was uh, growing, one of the greatest was that as it was growing, they wanted to deviate from his rule, which was uh, to beg for their food. And I don't know, maybe it's uh, practical things that need to be done, but uh, they, they didn't want to do it uh, that way, and uh, that uh, broke his heart. There were uh, dissidents also uh, within his community. Uh, many of those who were uh, nearest and closest to him, there were the malcontents, uh, two bikers that were his uh, right uh, and left hand, uh, turned against him. And in, in effect, uh, ousted him from the leadership. He struggled to preserve uh, his ideals. I love St. Francis of uh, Assisi. And I really praise and thank God that uh, he allowed me to be born on this day and have uh, St. Francis as my uh, patron saint. And I look forward to him, his uh, love for the Lord, uh, his zeal for souls, his uh, simplicity, uh, his disdain for, for pomp and uh, power and uh, privileges. Uh, I, I hope that I would be truly uh, worthy uh, to have his name and to carry on with the work that uh, has been given to me. Great joy in uh, family. I really should have been lost because of my own wrong decisions in life but God truly blessed me and today enjoying uh, my apostolate uh, the, the family that he has given to me uh, not just uh, my children my grandchildren but uh, the family of uh, Couples for Christ uh, now uh, CFC FFL well, I have so many brothers and sisters that I know love me, that would welcome me, uh, that would give uh, their all as well for me as I give my all for them, that are my co-workers and comrades in arms in this uh, continuing work that we have. Uh, the joy and blessing of uh, the Live Christ, Share Christ movement that the Lord gave through our community for the church now almost five years old but already in uh, 26 countries and uh, really allowing us to engage in an even more massive work of evangelization a lay response to the call to the new evangelization allowing us to mainstream catholic lay evangelization to reach out to all of those lapsed catholics and to do it in a uh, methodological way insistent persistent doggedly just uh, really going on because this is what is truly crucial during this time. So, brothers and sisters, there's so much more that can be said and uh, I hope you have uh, some questions uh, for me that I will uh, try to, to answer. But just uh, in closing, uh, my motto which you uh, see in my uh, email the emails that I send uh, below my name from Philippians 1 verse 21 but for me to live is Christ you know, uh, to live is Christ is gain uh, death is gain and I give my all uh, to, to the Lord uh, wherever that brings me to this uh, wonderful life that uh, He has given me which I share with uh, many others or whether uh, finally uh, my time would be up and it is uh, time for eternal reward just just living Christ in death or in life is always gain and my one desire which I take from uh, the book of uh, Psalms Psalm 27, verse uh, 4. It says here, One thing I ask of the Lord, this I 
seek to dwell in the Lord's house all the days of my life, to gaze on the Lord's beauty, to visit His temple. I guess that's what you and I look forward to. I hope so. We don't want to stay in this uh, valley of tears. Uh, we stay because uh, we need to serve and there is much that needs to be done. And there are many people to be reached, especially the lost sheep, to be brought back to the fold. But we all look forward to our eternal life in heaven. And I, sometimes I imagine it. You know, uh, I think it will be different for different people. I mean, the, the similarities, of course, are in the kingdom of God. And you see uh, Jesus and the saints and Mama Mary face to face. But there will also be differences. You know? And it's, uh, it's a mystery, of course, what will happen there. But we know uh, that Jesus had a resurrected body where he actually ate you know, fish and bread, but he could also go through doors, you know, through physical barriers like doors. So for me, uh, because I love adventure, uh, I can imagine that uh, in the afterlife, we will be uh, moving around the universe, you know, uh, traveling in the stars, through time, in the instant, in an instant, you know, going to the supernova or to this black hole, uh, or maybe the even in this earth, the very depths of the sea, the highest mountains, you know, and, and doing that with uh, St. Peter and St. Paul and uh, Michael the Archangel and my guardian angel, my grandson Giovanni, uh, many of our, my brothers and sisters that we've gone on before and will follow. This is such a wonderful thing that uh, God truly has given uh, each and every one of us. And there is no life like this and at the end of the my uh, days when when finally it's uh, time to to go uh, I hope that uh, my my tombstone will uh, reflect uh, what is truly in my heart and this is what uh, the Apostle Paul said in Acts 20 verse 24 Yet I consider life of no importance to me. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to bear witness to the gospel of God's grace. Thank you, my dear brothers and sisters, for spending this uh, time uh, with me. And, uh, of course, our life together uh, continues. There is much work uh, that needs to be done. And uh, this is simply God's blessing for each and every one of us. Let's have a good day. It really is a day that the Lord has given us. Let us rejoice in it. So, full greetings. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for all of your greetings. Uh, I am overwhelmed. I know how much uh, you truly love me as I love you. I'm here for you. I just want to be able to serve you in whatever way that I can uh, serve you. Knowing that this is also God's way for me, for my own salvation. There's no life like this. There's a lot of pains and sorrows, a lot of suffering and oppression and persecution. At times, most painfully, coming from your own brethren. But that's how it is. And we follow the Lord who experienced all of these things. He was betrayed, he was denied. He was uh, tortured, he was uh, crucified, and certainly we follow that uh, same path. It's a uh, straight and narrow path, and right there in the middle of that path is the cross. Many, many evangelists, televangelists today uh, want to proclaim the prosperity gospel, but that's uh, not the authentic gospel, because the authentic gospel is the gospel of the cross. 
And at times we see that cross on the road and we try to avoid it and we, we seek another path to the left, to the right, and that's where we veer away and that's where we eventually get lost. But uh, the, the call of the Lord is just to go straight on and uh, embrace that cross because that cross is what will truly be a blessing for uh, all of us. Oh uh, uh, yeah, brother Tony. How are you, brother, in uh, Canada? And uh, is is your surgery still forthcoming? Yeah. We pray for our brother Tony. There are so many of our brethren who are truly in in uh, need. It's it's a world that is so much in need. Physical healing but uh, most especially uh, spiritual well-being. It's a troubled world. It's uh, deep into darkness and sin and evil, many of it because of our own uh, wrongdoing. But even for those who try to do good or live uh, in a good way, there are forces beyond their control that uh, you know, affect them directly and their family life. That's why there's such a great uh, urgency. And, and I hope that many more of our brethren would, would feel this great urgency. Yes, we have our families to raise. Yes, we have our livelihood to, to attend to. Uh, yes, we have to have our own comfort in life. But all of that comes. God never deprives us of these things. God is our loving Father who knows what is best for us, what is good for us, and all of those He gives us as His gifts, and He will never deprive us of those. But in addition, we need to serve Him and His people and His church, and to do so with passion and a great sense of urgency. If we're seeing our lives now as falling into better order, and, and we're enjoying family, and uh, you know we've got the, uh, including the material blessings that come from God. How about many others? Many others are simply not that way. And how will their lives change? Of course, God will work in their lives, but how does God work in their lives? Through people like you and I, that we become His instruments. This has always been the way. You know? And it's done through the work of evangelization the proclamation of the good news of salvation in Jesus. We tell them about this gospel and we help them to meet Christ. And as they do, as they respond, as they repent and turn from sin, then they enter into this wonderful world of the kingdom of God and they begin to live Christ. Living lives of holiness, living lives of discipleship. And then part of that life is that eventually they become evangelizers themselves. They're called to be witnesses. We witness by the silent holiness of our life, but also by our verbal uh, proclamation of the gospel. We need to share Christ. You know, to meet Christ, to live Christ, to share Christ, this is the vocation of a Christian. And God has blessed us so much in uh, Corpus for Christ, Foundation for Family and Life, that all of this should be evident to us. And it gives us the opportunities. Because we have the programs, we have the resources, we have the brethren that are here with us. We have the opportunities that are there. You know? And we simply cannot just uh, turn away from that, turn the blind, blind eye to it. You know? But we need to, uh, to go and share what God has given us. The gift that you have received, give as a gift. Otherwise, uh, we truly would be so selfish. Keeping all of these good things to ourselves, not the way to go. So. Okay, uh, we have a question here. How can we follow your example and also be uh, missionaries to the world? Well, many of you, many of our brethren uh, are already doing that. You know, many of us in the community actually serve. But uh, many, when you speak about uh, being a missionary, uh, usually you think in terms of going off uh, beyond your own uh, neighborhood or parish or uh, city or town where you live and to some uh, farther off place uh, to do the work. 
many of you are already doing that. And brothers and sisters, we need many more of you to do that. Because there really are so very many opportunities that the Lord gives us to do the work of evangelization within our own countries. In the U.S., there are so many more states to reach. And in each and every state, there are the towns, the cities, and the counties. Uh, in the Philippines, it's the same thing. Uh, still, many of those provinces and in every province, there's so much to do. Uh, and now as we uh, do the work of NCSC in the parishes, there are all of those parishes throughout the world. Just within one parish, there's so much work that needs to be done. Because even as I do this uh, macro uh, thing of uh, running around the world and doing mission, I'm also very much involved in my parish, the, the micro aspect. And I tell you, uh, even just in the parish, if they embrace uh, the, uh, uh, the ministry, uh, the movement that is uh, LCSC, uh, there is so much that we actually do there, uh, actually so much good that can be done. So, we're missionaries, because missionaries just doing mission. What is mission? It is the very uh, work of uh, the kingdom of God. You know? It is the proclamation of the gospel. It is evangelization. It is family renewal. It is work with the poor. So our most basic mission field is, first of all, our own family. And then uh, in expanding circles, you know, our neighborhood, our workplaces, you know, and uh, the cities where we are, the, the states or the provinces or prefectures uh, you know, or whatever. And then there are the many countries of, of the world. There is really much that can be done. So, let us know of your desire uh, to do mission. Uh, now, this gives me the opportunity also to say that one of the biggest difficulties that uh, we have is money. Because to do mission, especially in far-off places, requires money. You know, there are the opportunities. You know, they're there. Uh, many times, we simply don't follow through. You know, contact with this priest or this uh, uh, relative or this brother that is there and is just willing uh, to, to uh, help us to, to, do, to do the work. But we're constrained by money. And that can be frustrating at times. And uh, at times my uh, prayer is that, uh, Lord, you know, this is your work and nothing is impossible for you. Uh, if, we, if we have a mission in some far off place, why don't you just bid your angels to carry us to those mission places so that we can do your work? And in prayer, the Lord's answer is always the same. Uh, you have to buy a ticket. <laughs> so <laughs> that's where the constraint is. And that's why part of our uh, life, and life and work is really financial stewardship. In fact, unfortunately, brothers and sisters, this is the last to go. The last to be surrendered is one's pocketbook. And in 35 years of Couples for Christ, I've seen it. You know, people who were transformed, who are now giving of themselves, who are serving, you know, and, and uh, you know, giving their, their sweat and tears. But when you, it comes to money, ah, that's something else. You know. And within the Christian world, we know that uh, Catholics are the most uh, stingy when it comes to giving. But this is something that is necessary. And the biblical prescription for financial stewardship is giving a tithe, actually, 10% of our income. If Catholics gave even just 1% and not 10%, the church and our community would have more than enough to really uh, do all the mission that God uh, gives uh, us the opportunity to do. So it's very unfortunate. There's much evangelization. There's much conversion. Uh, there's much the strengthening of family and defense of life. Work with the poor. That can be done. And the money has been provided. People will, will, will ask, well, if this is truly God's work, where is the money? But God has already provided the money. It's right there in your pocketbooks. Look it up. Open up your purse. See, that, that's God's money. So, I hope that we will also grow 
in financial stewardship within uh, CFCFFL. Uh, we need to give regularly each and every month. The ideal is a tithe, which by definition is 10%, but you start with whatever you can give. And it's when we put all of these things together that it becomes a big fund with which to do mission. Then we can send many more of you who want to do mission. There are also others, you know, especially our young brethren. They finish school in, in very nice colleges and universities. They have very nice de degrees. You know, and uh, they, they can actually uh, find uh, good work and get a good pay. But because they have been through uh, YFL, they want to continue to serve the Lord. They work full time. But we need to give them something. And many of these brethren, they continue working full time. They, they get married. They have children. Then we need to give them a little bit more. Our, our wages are always sacrificial. Because it is really for the kingdom of God that people serve as full timers, not for the money. But they simply need it. Now we can have so many more of these young people who would grow through community and do the expanded work that uh, we have. But, you know, unfortunately, we're constrained. So I hope, brothers and sisters, all of you are listening, and you in your households, to encourage the brethren. Sometimes they think, well, you know, I can only give so much, it's so small. No, any amount. Because when you put it together, uh, then uh, that becomes big. And of course, when you start giving, you know, then uh, the Lord continues to work in your life and you see that uh, there's so much more to be, that can be done and you can probably give a little bit more. It didn't really hurt you to give, give what you gave and now you increase that a little bit. But please, let's work on financial stewardship. Then, then uh, many more can be missionaries you know, and uh, much more work will happen in the kingdom of God. With all the saints that are there, how, where would we start knowing them? The other things that are there, how, where would we start knowing them? Well, if you simply wanted to know about the saints, everything is in the internet. You, you want to learn about anything and everything, it's there. Just uh, Google it. Even as I went into the uh, Bible and really the Word of God became very alive for me and uh, doing talks that uh, you know our talks are all based on the scriptures and uh, in doing my books uh, what one one thing that was handy was the uh, what do you call it uh, is that the concordance where you have just a word or a phrase and you look it up and it gives you the reference in the Bible so you then you look it up in the Bible but now, you know, you just type it in, uh, the word, the phrase, and it, it comes out. <laughs> so, uh, you, you, uh, I haven't done it, but you ask for a list of saints, it probably will give you that. Uh, you ask for a particular saint, uh, it will give you that. So, if you want to know about uh, the saints and the lives of the saints, uh, it, it's right there, just at your uh, fingertips. You know? And it's good. I encourage that as you have the, the time. You might have your favorite saint. There are many others that uh, we never heard of but are there. You know? And we need to be inspired by them. We need to know that there is that high calling that ordinary men and women, uh, persons like St. Francis who was a man of the world and had nothing to do with, with but uh, can really experience conversion and live that lofty life and now be considered a saint uh, by the church. So we need to be inspired. You know? We need to know that hey, this is not just for those great persons like John Paul II or Mother Teresa, but it's for you and I. God takes ordinary people and makes them extraordinary. In fact, even in the service of God, you know, it's in the scriptures, He takes uh, the, the least, those who count for nothing. He delights in doing that. Because then we have no room to boast. We know that it's only by the power of God uh, and the uh, equipping of the Holy Spirit that we're able to do the things that we did. We do things that we never did in our life before. 
So uh, all of us are called to be saints with a small s. I'm sure a number of you will be become saints with a big S. But in the meantime, we are inspired uh, by the lives of the, of the saints. Get to know more uh, about them. In this year of mercy, will reuniting with our brethren from CFC Global materialize? Uh, well, the year of mercy is almost over. <laughs> so I, I don't think so uh, in this uh, year of mercy. Uh, that's a long, long uh, narrative. If, if the split that happened in 2007, if the foundation for that was uh, because of the work with the poor, Gawad Kalinga, of course there was much more there, uh, but basically that was the trigger. Now when we split in 2007, uh, I think uh, two years later, they also split CFC Global and Gawad Kalinga. And that's why people were saying at that time, oh, Frank was right. That should have been an opportunity for them uh, to come to us and to say, hey, maybe our difficulty at the time was uh, GK. Uh, but now that they've also split with GK, and if, if, if that was the problem, it, it was, that wasn't the only problem, but if that was, then, then it's gone. Why don't we try to get together? They didn't do that. Now, I'd just like to assure you, brothers and sisters, I've done my part. You know? From the very start, from the time of the split, uh, I had proposed that, okay, we, we have our differences, we try to talk it through, uh, the bishops intervene, but some way, somehow, uh, we uh, can get together, we agreed that we would go uh, separate ways, but my proposal from that time was, well, let's be one CFC with two branches. Because this is the history of the church. Again, as I mentioned earlier, you take the Franciscans. They started as one. Orders of Friar Minor, Order of Friars Minor. Uh, but then uh, uh, they, there was a split. Uh, you have the Capuchins, and then there was another split. You had the Conventuals. Uh, and then later on, many different uh, Franciscans, Franciscan uh, uh, organizations. You know? But today, the Franciscans are one. And maybe even that those splits were part of God's intent because uh, uh, the work was expanding and there would be certain uh, focus uh, that uh, new people as they come in, being led by the Spirit, uh, God would have wanted to do. So rather than staying together and, and fighting and arguing and not agreeing and uh, you know causing turmoil within the body, they go the separate ways that they can focus on whatever uh, it, it, it was. No? Uh, but anyway, so that was my proposal. And at least four different times, I spoke to their top leadership. And they know this, uh, you can ask them, the very top leadership. And giving that proposal. Some of them are quite receptive, but at the end of the day, uh, for whatever reason, you'll have to ask them. Uh, they don't want to accept it. I think that that's the way forward uh, because for those who want unity, you cannot just come together across the table and discuss. Nothing, and I assure you, nothing will come of that. The differences are deep and then there's the human weakness, pride and whatever. So you just end up fighting once again. That's why my proposal, if ever God wants us to be one once again, was that. Because it's very simple, you know, we're across the table and we just say we're brothers to one another, we came from the same stock, we're basically about the same things, family renewal, evangelization, you know? and, uh, you know, we're part of this uh, work of the church, we're serving the same Lord, so we don't want to, to be negative towards each other, we've decided to go our own ways, let's just be blessing to, to each other, and this is the way that it should be, and so we just agree. We, we shake hands and we embrace, we are brothers, but uh, two branches of the same uh, uh, stop. And uh, we do what we've been uh, called to do. And then from there, 
it's easy to, you know, because, because you've broken the ice, then it's easy to, to collaborate. You know? uh, I give a talk in your CLP, you give a talk in my CLS. You, know? uh, you invite me for this event, I invite you for this event. We can even celebrate uh, our anniversary together. The only difficulty will be who gives the anniversary talk. <laughs> Maybe two people one from, from each uh, CFC. No? And then from there, she become comfortable with each other. As uh, more and more the pains of the past would fade, as uh, new leaders actually come into overall uh, leadership, no? uh, then we can see. No? I'm always for what God wants. If God wants us to be united, then let it be. Uh, but every, uh, all I can assure you, my dear brothers and sisters in the Lord, I have done my part. I have reached out, I have taken the initiative uh, in four different instances to the very top leadership of CFC Global, you know, but they have not uh, uh, reciprocated in, in that uh, response. You know? and the reason is theirs, uh, I wouldn't uh, uh, judge what is uh, in their in their hearts so we leave that uh, as it is if the lord wants it it will happen and i'm not the obstacle uh, to it but if it is uh, better or if it is best that we simply go our separate ways i think it will still be good to have that kind of basic reconciliation you know, so that there are no animosities you know, because we're all supposedly we're all serving in the kingdom of god in in our one lord and so there should be a way by which we can uh, move forward together, even if these are separate paths. How can we pray for religious leaders, priests and nuns, who sometimes do not seem to live and share Christ in their actions and words? Well, the unfortunate reality is that uh, there are those. You know, uh, it's not just among lay people, but uh, there are priests, even bishops, uh, and there are religious that, you know, do not uh, live and share Christ in their actions and words. But it's the same thing with us. When you're thinking of uh, your relative or your friend that you want to evangelize, but you know it's difficult because he or she is uh, quite worldly, uh, it's not interested in God or has already left uh, the faith. You know? So what do you do? Well, you, you pray. You intercede for that person. You know? And then you, you work on the relationship that you have so that that person uh, will trust you, will feel comfortable with you, uh, will know that you are a true friend. You know? And then with, with that, with, with prayers, intercession, uh, and then your relationship, at some point, you know, uh, we invite that person to our program. And when they accept, then that is the uh, point of conversion. You know? So it's the same thing. Uh, lay people, priests, uh, nuns, uh, in the hierarchy, you know, we uh, pray for them. How can we pray? We, we simply pray for them. We, we intercede for them. But it's not just prayers, you know, but it is uh, that, I mean, if we have the opportunity, and, and I guess if we were thinking of uh, praying for them because uh, they seem to uh, oppose or are obstacles to our desire uh, to serve maybe in their parish or uh, in their other works, then that means we do have some kind of relationship with them. We try to develop that relationship. There are always a lot of good uh, in people. Uh, that, in fact, is the basis for uh, evangelization. You know, that uh, there is that inherent good in people, even as we are fallen and we have original sin, but we are all uh, creations of God. We are all children of God. And, and uh, we try to tap into what uh, that good is as the gospel is uh, proclaimed. But what truly helps is having a good uh, life-giving relationship uh, with them. Many times it's also a lack of appreciation for the ministry and you know some some of the 
our, our parish priests, for example, because they're, they're very, very busy. There's some bad ones, we know. There's been the clerical scandal in the church, sex scandal. Uh, but there are uh, really good ones, but, you know, they might not be so open and embracing to what we are uh, proposing to them. But there are many things that are happening. They're, they're, they're busy, they're preoccupied with other things, they prefer certain uh, postulates or ministries, uh, they just cannot quite grasp uh, yet uh, the, the vision and mission for what we are uh, presenting to them. So it takes a, a bit of work. On our knees privately as we pray and intercede for them, but also in practical ways as we uh, develop that relationship, as we take uh, every opportunity given to us to, to explain, to cajole, to encourage, uh, to uh, do uh, anything and everything in order to uh, get a, a person on, on board. And whenever we do this, we know that it is always helpful to everyone involved, including our beloved clergy and our religious. Sometimes the, the mind is, well, no, he's a priest, uh, she's a nun, so they, they're already there. And uh, all I want is uh, for them to, to uh, uh, help out or to support or to give us the opportunities to do our work so we can reach out to, to those that need it. No, we all need it. We just earlier talking of saints, so that's the call to everyone. 1 Peter 1 verses 15 to 16, As he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in every aspect of your conduct, because it is written, be holy because I am holy. And then Jesus himself tells us, so be perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect. So all of us are not perfect. Uh, many of us, most of us are far from perfection, including our beloved priests and nuns. So these things will always be helpful. As they get involved, as they participate, as they give up themselves, as they grasp, you know, uh, even these things about the new evangelization, there's not much really being said uh, in the church about the new evangelization. People don't know about it. They, they uh, don't know how to go about it. So as, as we simply uh, persist, not in an arrogant way, not, not in a pestering way, but uh, you know, knowing that uh, God has given us a gift that we can share. We do need to share with them. But uh, the beneficiaries will not just be uh, the lay people, the lost sheep out there, but they themselves. All of us, as we enter more deeply into the new dimensions uh, that the Spirit is opening up for us, all of us uh, benefit. And even for the good priests and nuns, because they are called to holiness they are called to Christian perfection, as we all are, then there's so much more that needs to be uh, done, you know, that we uh, really can, can uh, do. So waiting for more of your questions or your uh, inputs, uh, we still have a little bit more uh, time. Uh, we can use it to good purpose for that. Okay, here are a number. Our brother John Peter Hui, from our head in uh, Vietnam. His brother is an uh, amazing brother. And uh, just to say uh, quickly, uh, because sometimes, uh, well, uh, especially now, you know, uh, evangelization has been difficult. I know you experience it. You schedule a CLS, and uh, there are... Uh, you, know, you, you, you try to invite many, and then uh, few come. And of those few, uh, even fewer finish. You know? So it can really be frustrating. But many times we don't know the mysterious ways of God. You know, how we started in Vietnam, we have our uh, businessman brother, Domi Gregorio, who would go there on business, and because he had the mindset of a missionary, so uh, would look for, how can we start CFC? And anyway, uh, he was able to be brought in touch with our brother, John uh, Peter, you know, and, and gave the uh, 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 
CLP at that time. You know? And maybe people would have thought, hey, it would have been greater if, if there were so many more, so the time is uh, put to uh, good use. You know? But uh, uh, this uh, brother of ours uh, has uh, became the uh, instrument of uh, God to do a massive work in Vietnam. You know? And even up to today, uh, he is our leader there. And really going to different uh, provinces and doing a massive work. Uh, I really praise and thank God for you, uh, Brother John uh, Peter, and for many others uh, like you who have been giving their all you know, uh, for, for this work. But anyway, he's saying, during our mission work, we are confronted with several challenges, especially with the culture, traditional values, the pressure, pressure of the social environment of the past country. Past country. Oh. The evangelization work is very difficult. Please give us your input. Evangelization and especially missionary work is truly very, very difficult. But as we, as those who have done it, very exciting, very enriching, uh, very satisfying. Especially when we go into other uh, cultures that are not our own. That's why part of the missionary's uh, task is to learn a little bit of the culture. Don't just fly in and here is our Christian Life Vogue uh, seminar, the way we, we're doing things. And, you know, but, but how are the people? Uh, what's the background of the people? Uh, how is their uh, faith life? what is uh, important for them. You know? uh, for some, you can easily connect because you see traditional family life is important. So right then and there, wow, you know, we talk about uh, family life. You know? But uh, uh, it is a challenge and uh, we, the, 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 the gospel uh, is always the same. You know? Sometimes people ask me, how do we adjust? Well, first of all, I want I need to say the gospel is always the same. You know? It's the one gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ proclaiming Christ uh, who became man, who suffered and died for us, who gave his life and shed his blood on the cross so that we would win. Uh, he would win. He won for us our salvation. And the work of the church, uh, that body of Christ that was uh, raised up uh, by the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, you know, and uh, that church is a missionary church, then it is to spread and to reach uh, every nation, every tongue, every culture, every race. So the, the basic gospel message is always the same. But how we, how we express it, uh, how we present it, uh, the examples that we give, uh, the applications that uh, uh, we have, uh, maybe even certain uh, physical uh, postures, uh, whether you need to remove your shoes uh, if you're there in the venue, all of these are important as well. You know? We work, we try to work with uh, the cultures which are very, very rich, uh, the traditions that are uh, oftentimes so very life-giving and unfortunately are being in danger of being lost. Uh, the good uh, traditions and cultures of uh, the many different uh, peoples and races throughout the world, uh, we do want to preserve that and uh, the, the uh, Christian life that is one, uh, one, uh, one way of uh, living the Christian life, one proclamation of the gospel, but within that, that milieu, uh, within that uh, variety. 
So we, we can learn from our brethren, of course, uh, who help bring us uh, to establish our life and mission in a particular country or culture. And then once uh, established, of course, we learn more and more uh, from them. Uh, we teach each other. We're not just there as uh, teachers of the gospel, but we imbibe all the good things, seeing how God has worked uh, in these different cultures and uh, races and nations. How, how the spirit is a spirit of variety, uh, always uh, creating uh, new things, and how we can be enriched as we embrace the culture, which, which includes the, 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 the music, uh, the, the way of life, the uh, traditions. In fact, well, what is happening in the world is uh, the enemy is uh, bringing forth a counterculture, destroying all of the things that many of us uh, have known in all of our years. You know, destroying the family, destroying the wonderful traditions that we have and imposing a secular uh, culture, very humanist, very modernist, uh, very just uh, focused on the, on the self. You know, in many cultures, especially in Asia, there is that concern for family. And you see even uh, three generations of family uh, living and working uh, together. Uh, but all of that is being overturned. So all the more, as we oppose that culture of the world, uh, that, that darkened and evil uh, culture that has come upon the world, then we appreciate uh, the good things that have been there. We learn more, and again, in learning more, uh, you just need to go to the internet. And there's so much that can be done there, including uh, phrases that you can impress your audience with as you greet them in the local language or dialect so we we look to those as well and uh, that's a uh, part of the uh, ministry as we relate in a very good way with the peoples that we serve after more than half of your life in the ministry what avenue are we going to explore to reach out to more people well this is precisely what the Lord uh, showed us because uh, in Couples for Christ, uh, as I was sharing from 1989 and into the decade of the 1990s, the Lord has already brought us into rapid and massive evangelization throughout uh, the whole world. You know? But now the Spirit Himself has redefined rapid and massive. And this, what, what the Lord has given us uh, now, uh, and, and the avenue that uh, we're not exploring, but we're already there to reach out to more people, is the Live Christ, Share Christ movement. And now, this is really massive evangelization. To reach into the grassroots and to the peripheries. That potentially can reach every lapsed Catholic. Because uh, the situation in the world, uh, the lost sheep are not the one out of the hundred, but actually the 99. That's how much work uh, that needs to be done. You know? And how can you reach uh, all of them? How can the parishes reach all of them? Many parishes today are on maintenance mode. You know? uh, still doing good, still serving the people, but not having... Uh, a mind or an eye to all those who are simply not there. You know, that uh, we cannot expect to, to come here, um, come to the Eucharistic celebration. No, we need to go out and reach out to them, to the very peripheries. We need to bring the programs right where they are. You know. And we do have those programs already. It is our experience in 30 years, five years ago, uh, in Gopos for Christ, that we've now packaged into a uh, church movement that is Live Christ, Share Christ, that can uh, we, we impart to the parishes. We teach them the methodologies, of course, the vision, the mission, the understanding of the new evangelization, 
no? and uh, we we uh, uh, help uh, uh, for, for the spirit to be able to empower them to do the work that we have already done massively billions uh, of uh, uh, Catholics and other Christians that need to be reached you know? so we now have the way by which we can do that and that's the live Christ share Christ movement you know Jesus always said the harvest is rich but the laborers are few uh, why will the harvest not be rich when when God himself has won for us our salvation when Jesus wants uh, this good news to be proclaimed to everyone where the spirit provides the empowerment and the strength you know? so everything is already there this is at the heart of God for not anyone to be lost you know? so the harvest is potentially rich but the way that God has decided to do things is through human instruments such as you and I and and that is why the laborers are few but the laborers are right there already in the church they are there in the parishes there are a lot of workers there They're, they themselves are very busy doing a lot of good things many good uh, ministries within the church but uh, at times not having directly to do with winning souls for the kingdom so if we can help reorient I mean if they will allow us uh, this is the intent of the Live Christ Share Christ movement to mainstream Catholic lay evangelization you know, based in the parishes of course we also do work outside of the parish but basically based in the parish so that the whole church will be mobilized and it can truly become the missionary church that God intends for her to be uh, right now our church is uh, into so many different things but uh, not so much the missionary aspect so we, we need to get back to basics but oftentimes people simply do not know what to do they don't know what the new evangelization is or if they've heard of it uh, how, how do we go about the new evangelization